If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. And they're going to put, the, they're going to keep this thing up here on the, because this, this is like, and, and if anybody knows, like, you know, we might add or tweak it a little bit, but this is something that God just, I just saw this as kind of, how many believe we're building a house together here at Crystal Brook Church? We are the house of God. You know, the house is not a building. The house of God is the people. Amen. The church is not a building. You are the church. We are the church together. And so last week we started, because I mean, know anytime you're building anything, you got to start with the foundation. And how many know the foundation is Jesus Christ? And we spent the whole week last week talking about the fact that there is no other foundation that can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? And if you're building your house on anything else, you're building on sinking sand. Amen? You're building on sinking sand. And when the storm comes, don't be surprised when your house falls. Remember that verse I talked about last week? If you fall apart in the day of adversity, there wasn't much of you to begin with. Everybody say amen or oh me or oh my or something. This is the truth, though. But how many know when you got Jesus as your foundation, I'm telling you, you cannot be shaken. This is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Am I right about that? So if you got Jesus as your foundation, everybody say, I'm going to be all right, amen? I'm going to make it. And yes, the storms are coming. Most of the time, we're either going into a storm, in the storm, or coming out of the storm, in between storms. In this world, Jesus said, you're going to have tribulation. But then he said right after that, be of good cheer. So everybody say, Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the only cup that won't run dry. You know, let me tell you, you know, it, it's the only reasonable thing to do. And so it's not just Jesus, but it's faith in Jesus Christ. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. How many could raise your hand and say, I believe that? Thou art the Christ. The sun, that's your foundation. When the devil comes or a demon comes, if you got Jesus in you and he's your foundation, you can look that devil in the nose and the eyes, nose to nose, and say, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And he's got to go. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's your foundation right there. That's your foundation right there. Amen? So, so Jesus, everybody say Jesus. But then the next one, and I, and I put it there kind of at the bottom of the four. Everybody say, I'm, what I'm going to at least take today, maybe another week, and talk about faithfulness. Because how many know that has to be a core value? Because I'm telling you, when, 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 God, when it comes to God, everything starts and ends with faithfulness. Do I hear an amen? See, and, and God's into faithfulness. You know, why would God be into faithfulness? Because he is faithful. And one thing I love about my God, one thing I love about him, and the reason I'm still here is because he stays faithful even when we're unfaithful. And I know none of you have ever been unfaithful, right? I know I have. Many, many times I did what I wanted to do. I went where I wanted to go. Don't look at me like that. Anybody else besides me? Many, many times I said, God, I'll never do that again. I did it again. And I wasn't faithful. And man, doesn't it just like almost hurts when he's just faithful right back to you? You like, you were just unfaithful. And he says, man, I ain't going to be unfaithful because I can't be because that's who I am. See, he can't be unfaithful because that's who he is. He's faithful. And the only reason I'm still here as a preacher probably still alive, quite frankly, is because he's been faithful to me. When I did my thing, he was faithful to me. He's never stopped loving me, you guys. How about you? He's always been there for me. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Is that faithful or what? So everybody say faithful. But he said, man, if you'll be faithful in the little things. And what I love about this, here's the thing. You may not be the most talented. You may not be the youngest or the oldest or whatever you want to put in there, the smartest. Maybe you don't got a college education. Maybe you got no education. Maybe whatever. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were born on. It doesn't matter. If you want to be, you can be faithful. I'm telling you, he's an equal opportunity God. And if you want to be faithful, you can be faithful. And if you're faithful in the little things, he'll make you ruler over much. That's the kingdom we're a part of, amen? 
You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. Amen? You, you know, you can be just an ordinary person who makes up their mind, I'm going to be faithful. I'm just going to be faithful to do what other people won't do. See, winners are faithful to do what other people won't do. That's why they're winners. And it's the little things. Everybody say little things. See how many know this ain't big stuff, it's little stuff. So, I'm going to talk about faithfulness, but, but I'm going to take a whole week here and talk about what I think is the most important one, okay? And kind of set this up. And I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark, and Mark was like, like into miracles and signs, and I'm kind of into miracles and signs and wonders. And I'll read the Gospel of Mark, and it makes me want to go out and lay hands on the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons because it's like a newspaper article. You know, it's just the highlights of Jesus' powerful moments, his powerful times. And you just read through Mark, and it's like, bam, bam, things are happening, and the dead are being raised, and blind eyes are being opened, and demons are screaming out almost every chapter, and it's just crazy stuff. Power of God. Now, quite frankly, a lot of Christians have never experienced any of that. Most churches have never, you know, they're just like, like it's just like out a different Jesus. It's a watered-down Jesus Christianity light. How many think we created a Christianity light? Just a little bit of Jesus. I don't want to go to hell. And I sure want to go to heaven. But I don't want too much of Jesus because it starts messing with my life. And then I start to have to die to myself. And that's no fun. Amen. You know, and all of a sudden, give me just enough Jesus to get me to heaven, keep me out of hell. But not enough to mess with what I want to do. And that ain't the gospel. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You want to know the gospel? First thing he's going to say is, hey, you going to come after me? Okay. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. You try to save your life, you're going to lose it. But here's some good news. You lose your life, you're going to find it. Amen? What will it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? But what can you give in exchange for your soul. See, that's the gospel, amen? My life for yours. Why would we do that? Because he went first. Why would we be faithful? Because he's so faithful. It's just a natural response, isn't it? If somebody's just faithful, 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 after a while, you get tired of being unfaithful to somebody who's been so faithful. You get tired of hurting people that love you and won't stop loving you. And all of a sudden, you say, man, I want to do something good because he's so good to me. He's been faithful, and I have been faithful to him, and I just want to change that. Does anybody else ever think like that besides me? I want to do this, you guys. I don't have to do this. I want to do this, Okay. So let me read this story. i got to get going here because this is really going to be good, and I'm just preaching on and haven't even read the scripture. So, so this is Mark chapter 3, and I was just reading through Mark, and I came across this, and God just began to speak to me, okay? And, and here's what, we're going to read three verses. Mark 3, starting with verse 13 through 15. Here's what it says. And he went up on a mountain, and he called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that you would put your words in my mouth today. That you would speak through me, Lord God, your word. Put me on, like Bishop says, like a coat and wear me. And help us today, Lord, to become more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. So. Let's look at verse 13, and I just wrote a few things down. But everybody say faithful. And here's what I want you to do, you know, so make sure you stay awake. I want you to turn to the person next to you, give them a high five, and say, keep your appointment. Keep your appointment, okay? That's the title of the sermon is keep your appointment. How many have ever had a doctor's appointment? Amen? How many know, like, when you have a doctor's appointment, you're pretty careful, aren't you, to keep your appointment, right? Valerie, you work in your nurse, and when people have an appointment, you expect them what? To show up at the appointed time. Let me tell you, here's what God's put on my heart. Listen, guys, God has given us a time of appointment for him. And my message today is keep your appointment. 
keep your appointment. But let's just look at a couple things here. There's a lot of cool stuff in here. Start with verse 13. It says, he went up to the mountain. And if you study this a little bit, most people believe he, he had gone up there previously and prayed. And then after he'd been up on the mountain and prayed, it says, then he does this. It says, and after he'd gone up on the mountain, he called to him those whom he himself wanted. And the first thing I wanted to point out here, the first thing he did is he called them. And I don't know about you, but how many know, like, we've all been called by the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is, are you, are, have you heard the call? Amen? And it says, first thing he did, he called them. He called them. And, and let me just say this. Every single one of us in this room right here, you were created. This is, is going to blow your mind. You were created with a holy calling on your life. Not just a calling, but a holy calling. And how many believe there's probably some lawyers that are supposed to be preachers and probably some preachers that are supposed to be lawyers? And everything in between. Am I right about that? But you got the holy calling. You say, well, show me that in the Bible. Okay. 2 Timothy 1.9. Look up there. It says, who saved you and called you with a holy calling. Before the foundations of the world were formed, amen, I gave you purpose and I gave you grace. Everybody say, I got a holy calling. Okay? And here, I'm going to tell you how many want to know what your calling is. Okay, one. That's, that's good, though. I'm really encouraged. By how many want to know what your holy calling is? Okay, we got five now. How many want to know what your holy calling is? No matter, I ain't gonna, no matter how much, nobody's going to do it. They're just not going to do it. How many want to know what your holy calling is? <laughs> so I'm trying to participate. Because I'm going to tell you what your calling is this morning, at least initially, okay? But it's a holy calling, and a calling is an in invitation. So in other words, he went up on the mountain, and he gave these 12 an invitation. And what I love about the kingdom right now, it's a whosoever will kingdom. Amen? It, he said, hey, guess what? You're invited. I'm calling you. You got a holy calling. I'm calling you to come up on a mountain and be with me. You got a holy calling on your life. Amen. He called you with a holy calling. And it says, he, 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 I invite you to come and be with the high. How about this? Matthew eleven twenty. 20 says, come to me. Everybody say, come to me. That sound like a calling? He said, come on. If you're weary, if you're burned out on religion, Come away with me. Come on. Get with me. And can I tell you, that's your holy calling right there. Your holy calling. It's a holy calling from God. And then if, you, if that ain't cool enough, look what it says there. It says, and he went up on the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted. That's, uh, that's if you go back to uh, Mark 3, 13 there. He called to those self those he himself wanted. And as I was getting ready for this, I'm like, wow, how many people just want to be wanted? How many know somebody besides you? And probably the number one driving thing sometimes in your life, in your heart, and young people, teenagers, kids, they want to belong. They want to be wanted. How many want to be not just wanted, but be needed? Man, I want to be useful. I, I, I want to know somebody wants me. Well, I got some good news for you. Jesus right here is saying, come, he called to himself those he wanted. I need to tell somebody, he wants you. He wants you. You say, oh, you're not, not me. My, my life's a mess. I messed my life all up. I made a bunch of stupid things. No. He says, no, I want you. Not only do I want you, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, and I already ordained you. I already appointed you with a holy calling. And, then that, and I just think, you know, I love, this, I love to say this. I want to be a part of a kingdom where you can belong before you behave. Amen? Because most religionists says behave, 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 and 
you quit smoking, cussing, chewing, drinking, get your life together, then we'll have a vote on it. And maybe you can come over here and be just like us. Maybe. And people like throw up and run away. Say, I don't want nothing to do with that. That's, that's garbage. But how about a place where Jesus says, listen, you can come just as you are. You can belong before you behave. Amen? That's the kingdom of God, isn't it? Hey, come on, I'll take you just the way you I go. I love you too much to leave you the way you are, but I'll take you the way you are. Am I right about that? It's a holy calling, you guys. And not only does he call you, he wants you. He made you. He created you. I mean, you had purpose before the foundations of the world were formed. He, you were somewhere in Christ, and he already knew you, ordained you, had a holy calling for you before you even came on this earth. And how many think, man, I want to know what that is, amen? I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to live this life and go out never knowing why I was created. Do I hear an amen? So there's this desire. To, you know, why do people do crazy stuff? Why do people do all the stuff they do? Because they want to be wanted. They want to belong. How many know, like, how many know there is the infection from rejection? Anybody ever got the infection from rejection? Amen? And you got rejected and rejected and rejected, and now you just, like, put up your walls, and you can't belong anywhere because you ain't going to give your heart away because you've done been infected by rejection. Amen? And, and now all of a sudden, you, you know, you tried to do it. You tried to belong. You got rejected, and now I'm too afraid to try again because I can't handle rejection. And can I tell you, we need to have a church and a kingdom of God where people know if they walk in those doors, they will not be rejected. Amen? Jesus said, come to me. Come on. I'm calling you with a holy calling. I want you. If nobody else wants you, I want you. I'll take your ashes and give you beauty for ashes. So I don't... I don't want to hear anybody ever say you're not wanted after this sermon. Amen? Raise your hand if you know you're wanted. Maybe you don't think nobody else wants you, but he wants you. Is that good news? And, and, and so what was their response? Look at this. It says, verse 13, and they went up the mount, and he went up the mountain, and he called them to him, and then he, though he himself wanted them. And what was their response? And listen to me. You guys, who, you got to do this. You got to come. How many have found out if you, he ain't going to make you come? He's not going to force you to come. He's not going to force you to seek him. He's not going to force you to do anything. Have you figured that one out yet? Matter of fact, he's a giving and a giving in God. And let me tell you, if you want to do something else, he'll let you. Anybody been there and done that? Like, I'm going to go do what I want to do. It's okay, go ahead. I'll be waiting on you when you come back. I've done that hundreds, if not thousands of times. I know that's the truth, isn't it? But it says, and they came to him. Listen, you guys, he wants you. He's calling you. But you got, you got to come. You got to come. He's, listen, you're not waiting on him. He's waiting on you. Anybody believe that? He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on you. I'm up here on the mountain. I done called you. I want you. I'm just waiting on you to come. Where are you at? Amen? And so let's go on to the next verse. That was in verse 14. Then this is this interesting thing. Then he says he appointed the 12 that uh, they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. And, and, you know, here's a really important word. That's where I got my message, the title from my message. It says, and he appointed the 12. Everybody say appointed. And that's where we get the word appointment. I mean, no, like before they, I believe before they were ever born, they had this appointment with God and maybe didn't even know about it. How many think he already knew this day was coming for them? And let me tell you, he had a day appointed for you too and for me. And he appointed them. The point of the 12. Okay? And let's look at this word appointment because appointed is really... It's really interesting because if you look it up in the dictionary, you look it up in the Greek and the Hebrew and all that stuff, which I don't know any of that stuff. I just get out the strongest concordance, and it does it all for me, you know. And I looked it up, and, and, and even in the bottom of my Bible, it says, here's what the word he appointed the 12. It means to make something of someone. 
How many want to be something in your life? How many want to make your life count? How many want your life to make a difference? How many don't want to just be taking up space and eating food and breathing air, you know? I mean, like, how many want, like, no, no, I got purpose. I got, you got an appointment with destiny. You got an appointment with purpose that was given to you before you were even born. But you got to come. You got to come after this. He's calling you. He wants you. He's appointed you. He said, listen, I will make something out of you that's going to make a difference. And so appointed means to make someone into something. And I love this, you guys. Think about this. Think about this. If you, anybody, anybody listen to Joyce Myers preach about the 12, the 12 disciples? Anybody ever, ever hear that crazy, funny stuff and they go through and like, they're talking about these guys. And they're, they're like, they're like, they're like a motley crew. I never listened to them because I was in between my BC and Christian days and all that stuff. But I mean, no, they were like, they were like, they were like a wild bunch. They say between five and seven of them were rough fishermen. And then there was the tax collectors who were out and out sinners and people hated. And then there was everything in between. But these, listen, you guys, these weren't the sharpest, the best, the educated. These were just simple, ordinary folk, just like a lot of us. Amen? They, they weren't highly educated. They, you know, they hadn't been to the best colleges. You know, they probably talked rough and acted rough and lived rough. And, and nobody else would have picked them but Jesus. And just study them. These guys are like ordinary folks. And they are full of themselves. They're full of pride. They're always arguing about who's going to be the greatest. They're going to call down fire from heaven and French fry people and all kinds of stuff. You know, and, and they see, why am I saying all that? I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. See, they were just people like us, you guys. He calls ordinary people to be with him, but then he appoints them and says, I'll take ordinary people and I'll do extraordinary things. Should that give us all hope? I mean, you, you could just be an ordinary person. And God said, but I've appointed you to be with me. And when, when, you, when you keep your appointment, I will take an ordinary person and make them extraordinary. How about this one? I wrote this down. He will take a, a natural person, and the next thing you know, they're walking in the supernatural. Woo! Amen? How many like to go from natural to supernatural? Amen? Well, you got an appointment to do that. Amen? You got a holy calling to do that. Amen? He wants you to do that, and here's the appointment he appointed the 12 to be with him. And it just got really quiet. Here's what I wrote down. The highest calling on your life and on my life is right there. You want to know what your calling is? You want to find your destiny? You got an appointment with destiny, but you know how you're going to get there? By Keeping your appointment to simply be with him. Can I tell you this? And I don't even need to tell you because you already know it. But I'm just going to say it because it's true. And you all know this is 100% true just as much as I do. The devil and all hell will do everything it can to keep you from keeping this appointment. How many like to sometime just take your cell phone and smash it? <laughs> it's like the perfect distraction. Everybody say amen or oh me or whatever. That's the first thing when they come to Hannah's house and this heart, they think, oh, they think they're going to die. But actually they're set free. <laughs> and we say you can't have a cell phone. <gasps> I'll die without a cell phone. But there's times when I'm like, would you please take mine? What a distraction. Do I hear an amen? And, you know, I ain't going to tell you because then you'll look, you won't, you'll, you know, because, I mean, I, and it's just the little dings, the little lights, the little whatever, and, and you know, and it's just like, it's, a, it's like the devil loves it. But, but how about this? He will, he will use your sleepless nights. 
He will use your kids. He will use your job. He will use everything under the sun. And he don't care what it is. He's got one goal, and that is to get you to break your appointment to be with him. Because if you aren't consistently being with him, then you're not going to fulfill your holy calling. Whatever that might be beyond that. See, if you're faithful in the what kind of things? The little things. Well, how about let's start here. Keep your appointment to be with him. Anybody struggle with this besides me? We live in a crazy world that's so busy. And it's instant everything now. You know, if it takes more than three minutes in McDonald's, you're, we're like, like throwing stuff. And if you hit that button on that computer and you got to wait two seconds, you're getting a new computer. Am I right about that? We want instant this and instant that, and we're not satisfied unless it's like this, like this, like this. And come on, let's get on to the next thing. And I'm telling you, this is the key. Listen, you know, in all of my years of being in the ministry, which is quite a few now, almost 30. I'm going to be 30 here before long. That's a long time. If there's one thing I could say to anybody, to anybody, if you say, Pastor, if you could just say one thing, if you could just say one thing, if you just have one chance, you know what I'd say to you? Keep your appointment. Do I hear an Amen. All hell is going to try to get between you and your appointment to be with them. And I don't know what you're facing. I know what I'm facing. And since we start Hannah's house around here, it is crazy and chaotic. And, and you know, and, and I told Amber this week, I said, man, I got to go keep my appointment <laughs> because I'm going to go crazy. You know, we're all going to go crazy. But Samuel, no, that's what keeps you from going crazy. He says, oh, I, I want to guard against burnout. Let me tell you how to guard against burnout. Keep your appointment and you won't get burnout. The reason you're getting burnt out because you're getting robbed. You're not keeping your appointment because you keep your appointment. I guarantee you, you won't get burnt out. See how many know like this? You go to the doctor's appointment. And the doctor says, take your prescription every day and it'll make you better. Well, how many know what we do is we need to go to our godly appointment. And then God says, well, you need to take your prescriptions every day. Amen. And you take them every day. You take them every day. You take them every day. And all of a sudden you start getting better. But if you don't take your medicine, you're not going to get better. And let me tell you, it's when you meet with him, you get the medicine from heaven, and it's good for whatever ails you, amen? It'll mess up your anxiety, it'll mess up your depression, it'll mess up your sickness, and the next thing you know, you're like, man, I feel good. Bring it on. Let's do this thing again, amen? Come on. Let's do this thing. But if you don't keep your appointment and you don't do it the next day, next, how many like the next thing you know, man, I'm starting to feel a little anxious around here, you know? I'm like, I'm like, whoa, what is that? Man, I'm just starting to feel the weight of the world, and I don't know if I can do this anymore. Man, and I, you know, matter of fact, I don't even know if I, I don't even think I'm going to read my Bible anymore. And next thing you know, you got the weight of the world. How many know I'm, I'm telling true stuff right here? And next thing you know, the whoa, is me. And it's all because you weren't faithful in the little thing. Just keep your appointment. You know where religion gets birthed? When you keep doing the stuff, but you keep missing your appointment. And now, oh, how you doing, brother? Oh, hallelujah. I'm, I'm fine. That's a, you know, I'm fine. You ain't fine. You're dying inside. You're shriveling up inside. You haven't read your Bible. You haven't been praying. You haven't been worshiping. You haven't been going to church. How you, oh, hallelujah, I'm fine. How you do? Those, you know, sometimes the church door is the most powerful thing in the world. They can be blankety-blank this and blankety-blank that on the way, and you kids shut up back there, bam, and, you know, like and they come walk through the church. How you, woo, hallelujah, how you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm telling the truth here, aren't I? You know, I saw this, I saw this uh, TED Talk thing, and this girl was teaching. She was awesome. And she says, I'm going to write this dirty four-letter word up on the chalkboard here, on the marker board. And she starts out, she puts four little lines to put four letters, and the first one is F. And so, you know, your mind went somewhere else too right then probably. 
So everybody's singing the same thing. She says, this is a dirty word, dirty, dirty word. And guess what she wrote? Fine. Fine. See, you can miss your appointment, miss your appointment, miss, but then you get into religion. Well, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. How's your kids doing? Oh, they're fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I'm, not, I'm talking some truth here this morning, aren't I? It's kind of got quiet in here, so I'm going to move on here in a second. But, but how many know, like, how many know, like, but here's the thing. You know what keeps you real? You know what keeps you genuine? Keep your appointment. You know what keeps you at peace? Keep your appointment. And then people be asking you, what kind of drugs are you on now? And I'm like, I'm on the most high, amen? I take a heavy dose every day. I keep my appointment. Amen, I'm, I'm faithful to take my prescriptions every day. Amen? I take my medicine from heaven. And if I miss a day or two, which I have done, I start, I'm serious, man. I, I get nervous. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I start losing my peace. I start losing, I start, and all of a sudden, little things start becoming big. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And something little, now it's huge. And you know, now the whole church is falling apart. And I quit. I'm done. Why? Because we weren't faithful just to keep our appointment. You know, mature, let me tell you what maturity is. Maturity is getting to the place in your life when you realize you cannot give yourself the option to miss your appointment. That's maturity. Because I've done been there too many times, and I know when I don't keep my appointment, things start going downhill fast. See, let me just tell you this. The battle's not to produce good fruit. The battles to keep your appointment and stay connected to the vine. Because if you keep your appointment and stay connected to the vine, you'll have more fruit coming off your branches and people be flocking you and say, man, can I have some of that? Can I have some of that? What do you got? Man, what are you, what are you doing? What are you, like, I've just been keeping my appointment, man. I've just been hanging out with Jesus. Can I tell you, you want to be more like Jesus? How many want to be more like Jesus? Keep your appointment. You hang out with him you'll start becoming more like him. I know me and Lisa, we've been together almost 40 years, going 37, 38 now, what is it? 40 next year. That's a long time. It's only more than that, but that's a long time. But you start thinking alike. You know when you're going to have pizza before you even talk. I mean, that's important stuff, you know. We're like, we know, like, we know, I, we just know. I mean, know what I'm talking about, you know? And she's thankful that we don't start looking alike, but, <laughs> but, but, you know, but how many know, like, you hang out with somebody, you start taking, you start becoming like them. And see, what you focus on is what you become. And the devil, the one thing he doesn't want you to do is keep your appointment to be with him because he knows if you be with him, you're going to become like him. And so we got to keep our appointment he said, and he appointed the 12, listen, to be with him. Can I tell somebody, oh, I got the minister, I got the call to minister, I got to go preach, I got to go do this, I got to go this. And I'm saying, you better keep your appointment to be with him, because if you don't keep your appointment to be with him, you won't have a ministry. And you can get into religion. People say, oh, that church over there is religious. Can I tell you, anybody can get in religion quick just by missing your appointments over and over. And the next thing you know, you're just going through the motions. Going through the motions. Everybody, you got everybody fooled. You're playing the game. Playing the game. And you ain't, you ain't been alone with Jesus for, you know, and you haven't been reading the Bible. You haven't been praying. You haven't been worshiping. And, 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 it, and it doesn't bring forth good fruit. Okay, so I got to come in for a landing here. But so I was just reading through chapter 3. It says so the, the high calling, the appointment. If you want to be something, if you want him to make you into something, here's where it all begins. Be with him. Be with him. I think I'm making that point pretty good. 
So if you go on over to Mark chapter 4, which is a really interesting chapter, because he starts talking in all these parables, 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 the parable of the sower, the parable of the mustard seed, parables, all these parables are going on. And if you read them, like, they're like, hey, we don't get it, Jesus. Like, they, he told the parable of the sowers. And, and it says, but if you look here, and I was just reading through this, and I've never seen it before, but in chapter 4, verse 10, look at that real quick, and I think he's going to put it up there. It says, and when he was alone. How many know the multitude went home, but not everybody went home? Some said, hey, no, we're staying with you, Jesus. We're hanging out with you, Jesus. And when they were alone, then he opened their eyes to understand the parable. But most everybody are done went home. I could say some other things there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and so it says, when, everybody say, when they were alone. How many know you want to you know the secrets? You want to understand you got to keep your appointment to be with him because it's when you're alone with him. It's when it's you and him and you and, and there's intimacy. That's when he's going to begin to reveal the truth, reveal the parables. You're going to start saying, whoa, look at that and look at this. And he's going to show you wondrous things from his word. Why? Because you kept your appointment to be with him. And all of a sudden now you're understanding things that other people don't understand because unto you it has been granted to see. But unto them it's not been granted. They're blind. It's the ones who were alone with him. You see that? And then if you go over to verse number 34, here we go again. He's talking parables, parables, parables. And then they get, and then all of a sudden in verse 34 it says, And without a parable he did not speak to them, but when they were alone. When's the last time you've been alone? Just you and Jesus. When they were alone, he says, I'm going to share my secrets to those that fear me, those that are intimate with me. Amen? You know, and, and so, so, you know, I think I'm making this point so I can come in for landing here. I'm, I see the runway out there and everything. But one of my favorite verses, because how many, how many, how do you get to know anybody? You know, you know, like, like, for instance, whether you like our president now, that's not, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter to me. But guess what? I can say, I can't say I know him. Now, because he tweets all the time, does all that crazy stuff, I know a lot about him. We probably know way more than we want to know, amen? Because <laughs> he's, like, pretty free on his stuff. And, you know, I'm just saying. And you could say, oh, well, man, I read those tweets, so I know him. No, you don't know him. You know about him, amen? And you read about him, and you hear about him, and all this stuff about him, but you don't know him because you've never had an appointment with him. You've never spent quality time with him. You don't know him because you've never hung out with him. You can't know somebody that you don't hang out with. And there ain't nobody in this room knows me better than my wife. And she knows what I'm saying when I ain't saying nothing. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to know she knows my language. When I'm pouting, she knows how to, she, oh, yeah, here we go again. He's all into himself. And he's saying, you know, here we go. It's going to be a hard day today because he just won't talk to anybody. Well, I'm talking without talking. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> but how does she know my language? Because she knows me. We hang out together every day. We're together. She's my wife. Ain't nobody knows me better or I know better than her. Is that right? And, and let me just go back to where I started, you guys. This is so amazing. If you want to know him, you can. Keep your appointment. He's an equal opportunity God. Raise your hand if you get 24 hours a day like I do. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but I get up and go to work, and I got this. I'm looking at a gal here. I mean, I hear people say, oh, I ain't going to come on Wednesday night or whatever because I go to work, and I'm tired. And I'm like, man, my wife gets up at 4 o'clock, drives to Bartlesville, works all day long, comes home, does book for Hannah's house and the church, and comes to the church that night and does the kids' ministry for two hours. And people say, oh, I'm going home. Go sleep. Everybody say amen or oh me. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, and I'm just saying, you know, uh, there, there is a price to, you know, there, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that, but, but I'm just saying it's the truth, isn't it? Because like I said, if you want to, because see, people say, oh, well, I'm too busy. I, I ain't got time to be with Jesus. I ain't got time to go to church. I ain't got time to read my Bible. You don't know what I'm doing, man. I, I work 12 hours a day, four days a week. Well, th that's the real world. 
How bad do you want? How hungry are you? How thirsty are you? You know, you might need to get up 30 minutes earlier so you can be with Jesus and keep your appointment. Amen? And let me tell you, your work's going to go better. Your job's going to go better. Your marriage is going to go better. Your kids are going to be better. Everything's going to be better because you kept your appointment. I'm telling you, that's the truth right there. Amen? Everything gets better when you keep your appointment. Man, you don't keep your appointment. You get grumpy fast. Amen? You can get mean fast. You can get nasty. You got to keep your appointment. So here's, here's why I set all that up. Daniel 11.32, one of the most coolest verses in the Bible. Those who do know, everybody say no, know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. I don't know what that one says. Shall be strong and carry out great exploits. What's great exploit? How many want to carry out some great exploits for the glory of God? How many want to do something that makes a difference? How many want to change this broken, hurting, dark world? How many got friends that need help and need hope and need life? How many want to do something with your life? Then here's the key. Keep your appointment. Be faithful in the little things. And the next thing you know, God will start using you. You'll start changing your workplace. You'll start changing your family. God will work through you to bring life and light to dark places and crazy things. The next thing you know, like an eagle, you're spreading your wings to soar. You're doing exploits for the Lord. Why? Because you keep your appointment, and now you know him, and he knows you. And when you know your God, you will do great exploits for the glory of God. We got a bunch of eagles in this room, amen? And you, were create, you weren't a turkey. You were an eagle. You're not a turkey, you're an eagle. And you were created to do exploits. You were created to do great things. How many believe you were created to do great things for the glory of God? And you need to spread your wings and soar and fly. And those that do know their God shall be strong and do great exploits. And let me just say this, the word know there is intimacy. You know, you know what I'm talking about, like Abraham knew Sarah? That kind of intimacy. Matthew 6, 6, he's going to put up here. Jesus said this, here's what I want, come to me. He just, this, this is the Lord's Prayer, chapter 2. But he said, here's, what, here's how you pray. When you pray, everybody say, go into your closet. Go into your bedroom. Actually, if you study the word closet, it's the word bedroom. And then if that ain't intimate enough, he says, shut the door. Shut the door on what? Everything that's trying to keep you from your appointment. Every voice, every, every distraction that says, you ain't got time to be with him. You better shut the door on that, amen? If you want to be fruitful and fulfill your holy calling. So he said, come into the bedroom, shut the door. And I love this. And the Father who is in the secret place waiting on you, when he sees you secretly, will reward you openly. Amen? See, miracles aren't birthed on the public stage, but in the privacy of the bedroom in the secret place and I'm almost done and so so then we're just going to finish up let's go back to Mark chapter 3 and we'll look at verse 15 and then I'm going to stop okay the last verse Mark 3 13 so after he called them and appointed the 12 to be with him that they might he might send them out to preach. And here's where it gets fun. And then it says, and they should receive, everybody say power. Where does the power come from? How many like this? You know, man, I've had experience in the last month. I've, I've had demonic, let me know. It's, I know most churches, it's politically incorrect even believe in demons anymore. But I've, I believe in them because I've been face-to-face -face with some in the last month. And when you're face-to-face -face with some, you believe in them. Amen? It's for real. But how many know, like, we have, we have been missing our appointment to the degree that the demons just kind of laugh? We ain't got no power because we sold out. We, washed, we, just, we just washed it away with, like, half-heartedness and complacency, you know, just playing the game. And I'm going to tell you, I mean, there's no power. It's almost like the demons laugh now. I don't know about you, but that ought to frustrate us. That, should that, shouldn't that frustrate us? And how about that? I want to help somebody. I want somebody to be free. And I want to be in a position where there's enough power to say, demon, you got to go, and it's got to go. 
I don't want to be that guy that says, hey, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Who are you? You ain't got no power. You ain't got no authority. You don't even know who Jesus is. And by the way, the demons whooped up on that guy. Amen? And so, look at that last part then. You know, it says, and that they could have power. That word power there is the word exousia. And this is so cool because there's four power words. But the word exousia is means that he would get, once they, they hear this holy calling, they come and be alone with him, they get to know him. Let me tell you, the next thing going to happen is you're going to have power released into your life. Because why? Because you've been hanging out with him. That's your source of power. That is your lifeline. And a person who consistently, faithfully keeps their appointment to be with him is going to be a person who walks under the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And how about this? When Jesus walked into a room, everything changes. When Jesus walked into a room, demons started screaming out. How many like to have so much Jesus in you that when you walked into the room, the demons start to cry out say, Whoa, Jesus has walked into the room. He, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, how's that going to happen? You're going to have to keep your appointment. I'm going to have to keep my appointment. That's why he's worked so hard to keep you out of that secret place, me out of that secret place. That's the word exousia, which means the authority, the right, and the privilege. Everybody say privilege. What a privilege it is to get to use the dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. And to be able to say, go, and those demons go. How about this? Be healed in Jesus' name. Okay, and I am coming in for landing. And so it's the right to use dunamis, dynamite power. And the last verse I have down here is this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Acts 4.13. And so the same 12, did they go on a little journey? They did, didn't they? Did they do it all right? No. Would they like us? Yep. Yeah. They were still arguing about who's going to be the greatest and all kinds of stuff. But all the way over, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. And then all the way over in the book of Acts, these same guys that were messed up, ordinary people became extraordinary. These same guys that had natural tendencies to get in the flesh and be selfish went from the natural to the supernatural. All because of the dunamis, dynamite power, the Holy Spirit. And we know what happened in chapter 3, books Acts, the, the lame man laying there at the gate, and they walk by, and they look at this guy who's been laying there forever. How many love to be able to have this kind of power flowing through your life? Been there 40 years. Everybody knew him. Probably his name was Fred. And the whole town knew him. And they walked by this time, but something's different this time, because they had answered the call to be with Jesus. And they waited on the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, they look down at this guy they've seen many times, and they stop, and their eyes meet. And the guy looks up, expecting to receive. And Peter looks at them and says, listen, I ain't got no silver and gold in my pockets. But such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And he reached down, took him by the hand. And this guy that had been lame for 40 years. And the Bible says he went running and leaping and praising God all through Independence, Kansas. And the whole town went crazy. And they said, like, oh, we knew Fred. Look at him. He's running and praising God. He's healed. And the whole city turned upside down because somebody answered the call to keep their appointment and be with Jesus. And now power is released, dunamis, dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. Not to spend on yourself, but to help other people. To minister to the needs. Man, people are dying and people are hurting. And I ought to break our hearts when we can't cast out a demon. And they just laugh almost. So I ain't leaving. This is my house. And I'm like, man, I don't know about you, but that's like, Something rise up inside of me, and I'm like, we got to do something, guys. We got to keep our appointment. We got to, we got to get back to where we were. But look what it says in 4.13. I'm done. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, did they, they were the 12, weren't they? They got called up on a mountain. They kept their appointment. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took note 
I love this part. And they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. One translation says ignorant and unlearned. And I always liked that because that always gave me hope, you know, and encouraged me. But they were ignorant and unlearned men. But look what they said. And they, they were ignorant and uneducated men. And they marveled and they realized that what? They kept their appointment. They had been with Jesus. You want to be powerful? You want to be anointed? You want to make a difference? Keep your appointment. I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to you. I've been, I'm busier than I've ever been in my whole life. I'm like going, like this, all day long. <laughs> yeah, she's laughing. And, and Deborah, I know those have been a part of heavy. And, you know, it can be crazy on a day like that. And I told her this week, I said, I said, listen, I said, Amber, when I'm done with chapel in the morning, I can't, I, I've got, I'm, I'm going to go keep my appointment. Then I tell you that this last week, I'm like, because the best thing I can do is your pastor. The best thing I can do is leading Hannah's house is keep my appointment. But I, do I hear an amen? Daddies, fathers, the best thing you can do for your wife and your kids is keep your appointment. Mamas, the best thing, wives, the best thing you can do for your husband and kids is keep your appointment. You will be a better everything when you keep your appointment and just be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so we have an appointment to be with him, appointment to be like him, appointment to be in his word, appointment to stay filled, appointment to worship. And if we keep our appointment, if we're faithful in the little things, he's going to make us ruler over much. I mean, let's stand up. Lord, we just thank you for your word. And I think the challenge is obvious because <laughs> I think I've said it 467,000 times a day. Here's the challenge. How are you doing keeping your appointment? How am I doing keeping my appointments? And I think the obvious thing is as we get ready to leave here, and I want somebody to go get Shander because I want to pray for her. She has double ear infection, and they're expecting to put tubes into her ears. And I said, can we pray for you? Because that would be an obvious thing, wouldn't it? And how many know God could heal a double ear infection just like that? And I told her, I said, I don't know what's going to happen, but can we pray for you? Because, hey, that would definitely be like, oh, wow, that would be like, well, we could prove that, you know, because they get in there and like, man, she don't need those two things in her ears. And that's where I'm at. You know, I said, I said can I? I said, I want you to come in here. And I don't know about you, but I, I just want to pray for her. And just, just release my faith. Because I'm going to believe he's still a healer. And we're going to pray for anybody that's sick in this room. He said, well, you know, nobody got mud, my baby got healed. Well, uh, well are we going to stop? I don't know, because the Bible says by his stripes we were healed. So if somebody could get Shandra. I want her to come in here. And, uh, but, but anyway, uh, here's the obvious thing. I'm going to challenge myself. And I work at this. I have to work at it just like anybody else. I'm not, you know, I know I'm going on. But my wife, like, she's amazing. She can wake up at 4 o'clock and just pop up out of bed, and she's in there working on the computer. And she doesn't even make any coffee. And I'm like, how do you do that? Wow. I'm like, I'm the one that gets up and I'm like, where's the stairway? And then I'm like, the first thing I do is I go, oh, Lord, let her make coffee. <laughs> no, nope, not today. So I find my way to the coffee pot. How many know what I'm talking about? And I find my way to the coffee pot. And, I, and it takes after about the second cup, I'm like starting to come alive. And, that's me. I'm, I don't know about you. And I've read the Bible. I've read Proverbs hundreds of times now. And I could just go through the motions. But you know what God's saying to me, Pastor Dick? Don't read it to get something from me. Read it to get to know me and become like me. If you'll just be faithful to read your Bible, he'll make you like him. He'll talk to you right there. I mean, he will talk to you, and you're like, whoa, he's talking to me right now. And he's waiting on you every day. And by the way, he's good with a cup of coffee, amen? Just get your coffee. Say, Jesus, give me just a minute here, Jesus, because I got to have me a cup of coffee. And I'll go out on the front porch. I'll go out on the back porch. And I say, Jesus, I need you today. Jesus, I can't do this without you today. If you don't come, I'm not enough. 
have you. The weight of the world is going to crush me today. So I come to you. I come to be with you. So Lord, our assignment for me, for you, how you doing? Keeping your appointment. And maybe, just maybe, some of us this morning need to say, you know what? I'm going to call my hotline to Jesus and say, Jesus, uh, could you set me up an appointment in the morning? I kind of been missing my appointments, but I make a new commitment. If I got to get up 30 minutes early, how about let's start with one verse. Just one verse will change your life. Five minutes will change your life. I guarantee you do five, and next thing you know, it'll be 10. Next thing you know, it'll be 15. Next thing you know, it'll be an hour. And you're like, that ain't enough. Do I have a witness? But how about start with a verse and start say, Jesus, I need you today. Help me today. I can't live without you. So that's my challenge to you and me, a recommitment, rededication. So, Lord, I just ask you, that we be a church, this is a core value, that we are faithful to keep our appointment, to be with you. Crystal Brook Church, Hannah's house, we make a commitment to be faithful, to keep our appointment, to be with you so we can become like you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to bless you. And